So the most important quantity in statistics that we are interested in is probability. Without probability, uh, we can't do computations in statistics, period. In simple terms, what is probability? Um, simple and philosophical terms at the same time. Um, probability is a measure of randomness. Um, everything in statistics um, or every method in statistics deals with random information, random data. So we need an appropriate measure, um, which is probability to study random data. Now, probability is something we've seen before. Probability um, sometimes it's also known as chance, the chances of uh, rain, the chance it would snow, and so forth. Um, a term that we have used in previous videos, proportion. Proportion is probability. Um, and then there is relative frequency, which is also probability, but I'll make a specific case about rel relative frequency um, ahead today. So, in order to compute probability, we want to know a few terms. Um, the first term or the first term is what we call a sample space. Typically it is denoted by the letter S or in advanced literature denoted by uppercase omega. So what is the sample space? Well, the sample space is simply the set of all possible outcomes in an experiment or study. So it has to be all possible outcomes, everything that you can think of when you perform an experiment. Let's take a very, very simple case. Suppose I roll a six sided die. The die has six sides and I'm going to have six possible outcomes. So the sample space would contain one, two, three, four, five, and six as the possible elements. Because if I roll a six-sided die, I'm going to see any one of those possible values. So the set of all possible outcomes um, is the sample space. So for the experiment that is rolling a six-sided die, all possible outcomes would be the numbers one through six. In a similar manner, think about tossing a coin. A coin, if we take a fair two-sided coin, A fair two-sided coin in the sense that when you toss that coin, you only land on either heads or tails. So I can only think of those two possible 
outcomes. So we have heads and tails, and that entire set would comprise or, excuse me, would form the sample space. Um, let's think of another example where you draw a card from a standard deck. So we all know that the standard deck of cards has four uh, switch, switch suits. So we have 13 hearts, 13 diamonds, 13 clubs, and 13 spades. And some standard decks have two jokers, um, so I'll just add two jokers also. So if I ask a person to draw a card from a standard deck of cards, it definitely will be one of these outcomes, period. So the set of all of those possible outcomes would simply become the sample space. And we need all possible outcomes in the sample space if we aren't going to find a probability. This is quite important. There is the concept of the law of large numbers. So what is this? law of uh, large numbers mean. This is simply um, a, a, a theorem that sort of explains that we have to um, do and perform an experiment over and over and over again for us to come up with an exact value of probability for a specific outcome. So in short, the law of large numbers um, is about performing an experiment repeatedly for a large number of times to measure the probability. I'm going, I'm putting this in the simplest uh, numerical measure possible, which is probability. So what do we mean by that? So if I rolled a die, If I rolled a die and I'm interested in finding the probability that I'll get a two, um, if I did it just one time, uh, there is no guarantee that I'm going to get a two to begin with. So if that is the case, there is no way that I will say with some amount of certainty that the probability of getting a two will be one sixth. No one knows, because as I mentioned, if you roll it one time, uh, for all I know, I may not even get it two. So how can I come up with the probability of getting a two? So you may say, well, I'll roll it 10 times 
and see what are the chances of me getting a two. You may get a number. Um, that number may be close to one six. It may not be close to one six. So, but if you keep on increasing, What the law of large numbers suggests is that if I repeat the experiment over and over again and computed the average of whatever quantity that I'm measuring, eventually I will get to the truth. So theoretically speaking, according to the law, if I repeated something, repeated an experiment time and time and time again and made a measurement, eventually I'm going to get the true value. But do we really have time to sit and do this a trillion times to get the accurate value? Um, no, and um, that's where statistics comes into play. Now, we can perform an experiment just 100 times and sort of give an interval or give information that the probability of getting it to when you roll a six-sided die is going to be about one sixth and we can be quite certain about it uh, to a certain degree. And that is the fundamental concept behind law of large numbers. But in practice, um, to verify the entire law, it's going to take forever to, for us to verify. Theoretically, we can verify it. So now we have the notion of classical or theoretical probability and empirical probability. Now, theoretical probability simply means what we do in theory. Um, but before I get into, um, give me one second, I want to see, okay examples not included. Um, so uh, theoretical probability is something that we can do derivations and come up with the value of the probability and we are going to say okay these are the chances that this is going to happen. So empirical probability on the other hand is something that we get from observations we have to observe. So consider the die rolling experiment and we want to find the probability of getting a two. Here, the moment I say getting a two, that particular statement will select a subset of outcomes from the sample space. In this case, uh, getting a two simply means probability of two. So it selected a subset two from the entire set of one, two, three, four, five, six. And we know the answer to that. The answer is one over six. And that probability is classical. Um, why do we call it? classical because
there is one outcome that five is getting a two and you divide it by the total number of outcomes in the sample space itself. Now, the rule that I highlighted as getting a two is what we call the event. So we always find the probability of an event. So here getting a two is an event. Can we think of another uh, event? Define event B as getting a number greater than three. So probability of B, PR stands for probability, simply means probability of getting a number greater than three. And we know the sample space in its entirety. I know that there are only six possible outcomes and the subset that would satisfy the event B would simply be four, five, and six. So the event B helps us select a subset of all possible outcomes from the actual um, sample space. So how many outcomes favored getting a number greater than three? Three. And how many did we have in total in the sample space? Six. So the probability is one over two. So probability of B and the probability that I computed prior to that, both of them are classical probabilities or theoretical probabilities. So Classical or theoretical probabilities are ones that are computed in experiments where the entire sample space is known accurately. So I can theoretically come up with a number because I know the entire sample space for a given experiment. Um, but I can also come up with an empirical probability to verify a theoretical probability. It is not going to happen all the time. Um, in most cases, one wouldn't even know what the theoretical probability is. All we can do is perform an experiment get an understanding about the event from the experiment, computer probability, and say, you know, good day. But that's the best we can do. But certain cases, we can verify the theoretical probability using an experiment. Um, but what is an empirical probability in contrast to a classical or theoretical probability? So empirical probabilities are computed from observations in a sample. So we measured something, we observed something, and we're going to base our 
probability for a specific event based on the observations, um, not the truth. For instance, um, let's just say uh, hair color of a person. Um, that would be my experiment. So if I want to understand this, the only way I can go and compute a probability is to ask people. So I'm going to ask them, well, what is your hair color? And some would say black, some would say brown, some would say blonde, I mean, natural hair color, and then some would say red. And we compute the number of people who said what and what, uh, let's say 50 people said black and 100 said brown, 20 of them said blonde and 30 of them said red. So that gives me about 200 in total. So if I define an event, let's say event C, is someone with a brown hair color. So I want to find the probability of C. So in this case, I actually do not know the entire sample space. I just know part of it to begin with. Could I certainly say that, um, I can write out or call out everyone with a particular hair color without any errors at all? Absolutely not. I'm basing this probability I'm about to compute based on the distribution, frequency distribution I wrote on the left-hand side. So probability of C would simply be 100 divided by 200. So, that simply would be number of outcomes corresponding to C divided by the sample size. Notice the difference. In the previous case, we had the total number of outcomes, I should have written it, in the sample space, the entire sample space. Here, it is based on the sample that you observed. It is based on whatever data that you recorded. So the answer here would be 50%. So if someone came and asked you, well, what is the probability that I would see a brown hat individual? You would say, well, there is a 50% chance based on this data. But is it going to be 50%? Or are you 100% certain that it would be 50%? Absolutely not. Because if I collected a different sample, I'm going to get a different probability. And this is where the law of large numbers comes into play. Instead of looking at, say, 200 people, if I looked at 2 trillion or more than two trillion people, eventually I am going to get to the true probability. And at that point, I can be very certain. But the issue is, we don't have two trillion people, you know, on planet Earth. So it's not doable. Um, So the one on the right here is, sorry, is the frequency distribution. And the value, the probability that we computed here would simply be the number of outcomes that corresponded to 
you know, people with brown hair divided by the total. So typically, this is what we call as call it as x over n. X would be the number corresponding to whatever event, um, which is C. And that would be the sample size. But if you recall that X over N is nothing but relative frequency. So the, the frequency corresponding to a specific uh, category divided by the total sample size. And that is simply the relative frequency. So oftentimes when we do find empirical probability, what we are computing is the relative frequency. However, most of us know that in practice, we're not going to compute uh, theoretical probabilities. It's just not feasible in many fields. So we always perform experiments. We always have data. So for any event that we consider, we can only find an empirical probability. Um, so instead of calling it empirical probability or relative frequency, in statistics, when we call something as a probability, we are actually referring to empirical probability. 99% of the time we are, because we base all our conclusions on data. So here is a case where we roll a die 100 times and we get a six 80 times. And based on these results, we'd like to know the estimated probability that the next roll will result in a six. So pretty much we are looking for the probability of getting a six. First, we've got to ask ourselves, to ask ourselves, is this an empirical probability or is it a classical or theoretical probability. This certainly is empirical because I am rolling a die 100 times. I am observing 80 sixes. So whatever probability that I'm going to compute is based on um, the one data set that I have, the 100 times that I've rolled. So, that said, what is the probability of getting a six? So the total number is 100. And how many sixes did, did I get? 80. So that would be 80 out of 100. So that would be 0.8. The question here is, based on these results, what is the estimated probability that the next rule results in a six? Well, I have discovered that based on my 100 die rolls that the chances of getting a six is 80%. So eighty percent is the same as 0.8 probability. So if that is true, then there is an 80% chance that the next die roll is six. Mind you, I'm not saying that the next die roll is guaranteed to be six. Um, I'm saying it's 80% likely 
that it is going to be six. There is a huge difference. Um, if someone asked you, well, would you bet $20 um, it, you know, that you would get a six? Well, 80% chance, that's pretty subjective. I myself would probably look for a 95% chance if I knew that 95 out of those 100 uh, die rolls resulted in a six, I'll be more than happy to pay 20 bucks and wait for the next roll because I'm certain up to 95% that I am going to a six, a get a six in the next roll. So a bag of 100 tulip bulbs uh, purchased from a nursery contains 40 red tulips bulbs and 35 yellow tulip bulbs and 25 purple tulip bulbs. And we want to find the probability that a randomly selected tulip bulb is red. And again, this is an empirical probability. We are going to base it on what we know and what we purchase. So I can construct a frequency distribution, even though it is not necessary. Um, but I just want to make a connection between probability and relative frequency. So the color, we have red yellow and purple frequency. We've got 40, 35 and 25. In total, we've got 100. So we want to know the probability of a red tulip bulb. That right there is our event. So 40 over 100 X divided by N relative frequency. So it is simply 0.4 or 40%. So in a similar manner, if we want to find the probability of a purple tulip bulb. It is 0.25 or 25%. So, in a national survey conducted by the Centers for Disease Control, to determine college students and health risk behaviors. Um, they were asked, how often do you wear a seatbelt when riding in a car driven by someone else? And this is the response. Uh, 125 of them said never, 324 said rarely, uh, 552 of them said sometimes, 1257 most of the time, 2,518 of them said always. So we want to construct a probability model for seatbelt use by a passenger. And the key words here are probability model. Now, what do we mean by a probability model? What we have here is response and frequency. We don't have any probabilities, but what do we know about probabilities? Um, from the previous problem, probability is relative frequency in some cases, 
and relative frequency is obtained from the frequency distribution. So what we have here is a frequency distribution. So all we have to do is convert each of those frequencies to probabilities. And if we do that, we can answer a probability question. And what the model that we have at the end of the day with relative frequencies would be the probability model. So we need a calculator for this. So we want to find the total first. So I'm just going to enter all of them in list one. So the total number of college students in the survey n is the sum of all the counts that we have and that number is 4776 Now, all I have to do is to take each of those frequencies and divide it by the total number. So, I get 0 0.0262. Point zero six seven eight point one one five six point two six three two point five two seven two. So those relative frequencies are simply probabilities. So if you take the response and frequency, if you combine it to get a table, that is a frequency distribution. If you took the response and the relative frequency, that would be the probability model. So what is the probability model? Um, So response um, versus relative, or I shouldn't say versus, response with relative frequency table is the probability model. If we simply look, look at it with the frequencies, that would be a frequency distribution. If we look at response and relative frequencies, that would simply be the relative frequency distribution. So that said, um, the next question is, would you consider it unusual to find a college student who never wears a seatbelt when riding in a car driven by someone else? So my answer would be yes. And why? Because the probability of never is nothing but um, or it means that the person never wears a seatbelt when riding in a car driven by someone else. So never would mean that statement that I just highlighted. 
And we know the probability of that from our model, that is 0 0.0262. That is about 2.62%. And that is a relatively small percent compared to the other cases. If you look at it, if you add all the probabilities of sometimes, most of the time, always, or just most of the time and always, um, you are about 78%. So the majority of college students tend to wear seatbelts when, when they are riding in a car driven by someone else. So for us to see someone who will never wear it, that probability is very small, and that is only about 2.62%. Okay. So this is in genetics, and there are several cases, multiple diseases that where um, this is used. Um, if you take a class in genetics, this goes all the way back to um, and genes and um, th there is a classical example on peas, um, the cooking peas, the green peas, and you can look it up, I forget. But probability plays a significant role in genetics. So this problem, it's where you have a husband and a wife and you have, both of them are carriers of sickle cell anemia, um, but they don't have the disease and they plan to have a child. So if a parent is a carrier, you would have the dominant sickle cell allele and the recessive sickle cell allele. Now, if you had both alleles to be dominant, then you will end up having sickle cell anemia. If both of them are recessive, then you will not have sickle cell anemia. And here they say the contribution is equally likely. How do we come up with this, um, with a set of possible outcomes. So, have husband and wife, and we know that the gene is composed of two alleles. Um, so the dominant one for the wife is uppercase S, the recessive one is lowercase S. Husband, uppercase S, lowercase S. So what are the possibilities? You'd either have lowercase S from the husband, uppercase from the wife, lowercase from both of them, uppercase S, the dominant gene from the husband, lowercase s, recessive from the wife. Sorry, that's uppercase. Dominant, dominant, and dominant gene from the husband and recessive from the wife. Now, you've got to be very careful in this problem because the sequence lowercase s followed by uppercase s doesn't mean the same as uppercase s followed by lowercase s. In other words, the two diagonal outcomes, they don't mean the same because it matters where this is coming from, where the uh, allele is coming from, the husband or the wife. So we have four possible outcomes. And here, that is the only sample space that I know of for this scenario. So SS, SS, uppercase, uppercase, S and S. So I know the entire sample space. So since I know the entire sample space, the probability here, whatever I'm going to compute, will be 
um, classical, it's theoretical, because I know theoretically these are the only four possible outcomes that will happen. So I know the scenario and the probability that I'm going to find is going to be uh, classical or theoretical. So that is part A. Part B, what is the probability that the offspring will have sickle cell anemia? In other words, what is the probability that the offspring will have a genotype a lowercase s, lowercase s? In other words, both recessive um, sickle cell anemia cells, uh, excuse me, alleles. So we want to find the probability of sickle cell anemia which would mean the probability of selecting the recessive alleles S and S. And in total, we have four. Out of those four, how many favor sickle cell? Just one. So it will be a one for chance. So we would have 0.25 or 25%. So part C would want to know the probability that the offspring will not have sickle cell anemia, but will be a carrier. So So we know that the child would be a carrier if the child has a recessive uh, allele. So in other words, the child must end up getting that lowercase s. So in what are the possible outcomes that would result in a lowercase s? Either both of them, s, s, or you end up having uppercase and lowercase, or lowercase and uppercase. And those are the possible ways because each of them will have um, a recessive sickle cell anemia allele. So how many outcomes do we have? We have three. And in total, we had four. That would be 0.75 or 75%. So I did a table to get the husband and wife and you know, wrote it all out. So here is a case where we have the husband and the wife. So node one, node two, two possibilities. So S, lowercase s and How do I? Trying to draw the tree the proper way, which would be easier to interpret. Uh, let me do it this way. So the husband marries someone here, and you have two possibilities with that person. So you have S and S, and or they marry this person, S and S. So the combinations here would be S, S. I should probably use different colors. They all look the same. Okay. So uppercase S, I'm going to use uh, a pink dot. Lowercase S, I'm going to use uh, a blue dot. So
And the outcome that we would form for the first branch would be, and that's it, I believe. And I'd have blue, blue. Pink followed by blue. Blue followed by pink. So those are the four possibilities that we would have. Um, so husband and wife, both of them um, end up having the recessive as well as the dominant gene. Now you can actually proceed further and say, well, what if this child that we have ends up marrying in another generation, but they marry um, someone with both dominant, one dominant and one recessive allele. So we have uh, blue, Right, and then you can actually form a sequence. So here I will have pink in the middle, pink in the end, pink, pink in the beginning, all pink, pink, blue at the end, blue in the middle. So the first case, would be that, followed by that, all blue. And blue, blue, pink, that, that, and that. So I have eight possible values. So now this is going to keep on going in, you know, generations. So you can see that the probability of getting sickle cell anemia would change from generation to generation, especially depending on who you get married to. Um, you know, very good example is Ancestry.com. They trace, trace you back to all different places. And we know this because we can look at it from a genetic level and say, well, this person is related to that person with certain probability. That person is related to that person with certain probability and you eventually form the entire tree. So you could form a family tree without knowing your, fa your family, but only with genes. Um, do we understand this process? So um, changing this, so that cannot be an outcome because it should be SS or SS only. So that would be two out to four. Point five or 